We have seen that when we multiply an applied force by the time of application of that force, we are talking about impulse, Ft. And we've seen that applying an impulse to something changes its momentum. Impulse produces a change in momentum. Now we want to discuss something similar. Multiplying the force on something by the distance moved by that force. The quantity force times distance is called work. To calculate the work on something, force and distance moved must be in the same direction. For example, when you lift a barbell, you push upward and it moves a vertical distance upward. Force and distance moved are in the same direction. So we say you do work on the barbell. The amount of work equals the force it takes to lift it multiplied by the distance it is raised. According to the equation W equals FD, if you lift twice the load the same distance, you do twice as much work on the barbell. Or if you lift twice the load twice the distance, that's two twices, you do four times the work on the barbell. The work done becomes energy acquired by the barbell. More generally, the work done on anything changes the energy of that thing. Energy is a concept that has intrigued investigators for a long time. Its definition isn't as clear-cut as the definitions for concepts such as force, acceleration, and momentum, because energy comes in different forms. For the time being, we can define energy as the ability to do work. The energy acquired by the raised barbell has the ability to do work on things if it falls. It can transfer its energy elsewhere. Ultimately, that energy may spread to atoms and molecules and increase their speeds. Energy is something that can be transferred or, as we will see, transformed. Consider the work done when a block of ice is pushed up a ramp. For simplicity, we'll assume no friction between the block and the ramp. Our guy pushes with a force F, a distance D, and gets the block to the top. We'll assume the weight of the block is 400 newtons. But since it's a ramp, our guy doesn't have to push that hard on the block. He finds a force of 200 newtons does the job. So he pushes the block a distance of 6 meters to the top of the ramp. Then the work he does on the block is 200 newtons times 6 meters equals 1,200 joules. The unit of energy is the joule, where 1 joule is the work done by 1 newton over a distance of 1 meter. So at the top of the three meter high ramp, the block of ice has acquired 1,200 joules of energy that it didn't have at the bottom of the ramp. Here's an interesting fact. Suppose the same block were lifted vertically to the same location. Then the work done in lifting it is the full weight of the block multiplied by the three meter height. That's 400 newtons times three meters, which equals, get this, the same, 1200 joules. So the 1200 joules of energy acquired by the block is the same as the work done to slide it up the ramp, or the work done to simply lift it three meters vertically. The 1200 joules of energy depends only on its change in elevation, the height to which it's raised. We call this acquired energy gravitational potential energy. We define it as weight times height. If we express weight as mg and height as distance h, we say potential energy equals mgh. The potential energy mgh is really an energy difference. It is measured relative to a reference level. For example, if the potential energy of the block atop the ramp is 1,200 joules, then its potential energy is zero joules at the bottom of the ramp. We find that potential energy, or we shall see, any form of energy, 
has significance only when it changes. When it does work, it transforms to energy of some other form. For example, if the ice slides back down the ramp or falls off the edge, its potential energy will transform to energy of motion. We'll cover energy of motion in our next screencast. But before that, I want to leave you with a question. If our block of ice weighed 500 newtons instead of 400 newtons, how much force would the little guy on the ramp have to exert to slide it up the ramp at constant speed? Until next time, good energy. When work is done on an object, it may be set into motion. We call the energy of motion kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is equal to mass multiplied by the square of the speed multiplied by the constant one-half. This equation doesn't come out of thin air. We can show where it comes from as follows. Begin with Newton's second law. F equal ma. Multiply both sides by distance d. Recall that distance moved from rest with constant acceleration is d equals one-half at square from earlier lessons. Then substituting for d, do you see that? I've simply pulled the one-half to the front. Then we see fd equals one-half m quantity at square. Now recall from earlier lessons that v equals at. Can you see that at squared equals v squared? I'm hoping so. It's a straightforward substitution. Then fd equals one-half mv squared. And there's our equation, which tells us that work done equals the gain in kinetic energy. I derive this only to show that kinetic energy is the outcome of concepts we've studied before. For the time being, know that kinetic energy equals one-half mv square, not particularly how it comes to be. Learn what you need to know without overloading yourself all at once. Now here's something you need to know. Recall from our previous lessons the block of ice with potential energy at the top of the ramp? Recall the block's potential energy had to do with its vertical height, not the path to get there. Here's an interesting fact. When the block slides down the ramp, its potential energy transforms to kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy gained is the same at the bottom of the ramp, whether it slides down, or falls vertically from the edge. The potential energy of the block of ice transforms completely to kinetic energy, whatever the path in changing elevations. Consider a simple pendulum. When the pendulum bob is raised from its lowest point, it has potential energy relative to the lowest point, which is at the bottom of its swing. It is held at rest, so has no kinetic energy, yet. Release the bob and it swings toward the bottom. At an elevation partway to the bottom, it has both potential energy, though less than at the top, and some kinetic energy. As it swings by the bottom of its path, potential energy is transformed completely into kinetic energy. At the bottom of the path, we can say, Potential energy at the top equals kinetic energy at the bottom. Then the pendulum continues to the opposite side. It won't swing higher than its initial height. If it did, the pendulum would have more energy than initially, which in physics turns out to be a big no-no. More about the no-no later. For now, consider the identical blocks atop three ramps of the same height. All blocks have the same potential energy relative to the ground level. 
The potential energy at the top becomes kinetic energy at ground level without encountering friction. Question. How does the speed of the blocks compare when reaching ground level? Think about that, and don't confuse time with speed. Until next time, good energy. The work energy theorem is one of my favorite topics. It simply states that the work done on something changes the kinetic energy of that something. Yum common sense. Work equals change in kinetic energy. This is the work energy theorem. See how nicely it solves this problem. Nellie rides her bike at velocity v along a straight road, and when she notices part of the road ahead is missing, she applies her brakes. The friction between her tires and the road is half the weight of her and the bicycle. How far will she skid? How to start a solution to this problem? First, get a handle on what's going on by drawing a vector diagram. We see there's a weight vector, always, and a normal vector, which is always when a surface is involved. Those are vertical vectors. And in this case, we have a horizontal vector too, a force of friction vector, pointing against the direction of motion. Friction slows the bike. So we have three forces acting on Nelly. What are we looking for? Ah, we're looking for distance. So we write d equals. That's a beginning, often the hard part. All we're given are her speed and the amount of friction that will stop her. Is that enough information? What relationship do we know that involves speed and distance? Ah, the work energy theorem. Work equals the change in kinetic energy. From work equals change in kinetic energy, we can say d equals delta ke over f, which more specifically becomes What is the force in this case? It's the force of friction. So we use the customary lowercase f. And we're told friction is half the weight of Nelly and her bike. That's half mg. So we have, ah, that takes care of the mass, which wasn't given, for we see that m cancels. So apparently the mass doesn't affect the sliding distance. Hmm. More about that in a bit. So after canceling m and the factors of one half, we get our problem is solved. She slides a distance v squared over g, which hopefully is less than the distance to the missing road surface. Does the equation make sense? The speed squared tells us that if she were traveling twice as fast, her distance of skid would be four times as far. That seems right, for twice the speed in the kinetic energy equation tells us kinetic energy is four times as much. How does g, the acceleration of gravity, play a role here? g is in the denominator, which means the greater g, the less d. For example, on a planet with more gravity, it seems right that she'd skid a shorter distance, more grab with the surface. Or on a planet with less gravity, she'd come to a farther stop, less grab with the surface. And how about the cancellation of mass? This relates to the force of friction. You've got to know that the amount of friction on something is directly proportional to the normal force on that something. And on a level surface, weight mg and the normal force have the same magnitude. Equal and opposite, actually. So greater normal, or in this case, greater weight, means greater friction, directly proportional. Which makes sense. Suppose she and the bike had twice the weight, then she'd experience twice the friction. Twice divided by twice cancels out. Hence we see that mass cancels in this problem. How nice! How frustrating if you think maybe the problem cannot be solved because the mass of Nellie and her bicycle isn't given. 
That's why it's good practice to solve problems with symbols rather than numbers. With symbols, cancellation becomes evident. Symbols first, numbers later. Let's put some numbers into this problem anyway. Suppose our initial speed is 10 meters per second. You know what? We don't need to know her mass, the bike's mass, or the color of the road surface. All we need to know is the initial speed and, of course, that g equals 10 meters per second squared. Then we see the distance she skids is 10 meters. A yum problem? I want to leave you with a question. If the missing road surface was 6 meters in front of Nellie instead of 10 plus meters, what's the maximum speed she can have to stop safely? In other words, V equals what? Until next time, good energy. A major foundation in physics that extends to all the sciences is the conservation of energy, which states, energy cannot be created or destroyed, it may be transformed from one form to another, but the total amount of energy never changes. As an example, consider the energy states of a block of ice sliding down an inclined plane. We start by doing 100 joules of work to lift the block from the floor to the top of the incline. So at this location, where the block is at rest, its potential energy is 100 joules and kinetic energy is zero for this location. Since the potential energy at the top is 100 joules with respect to the bottom, can you see that potential energy at the bottom is then zero? And what does that tell you about the kinetic energy at the bottom? Can you see it must be 100 joules? What we see is the total energy is the same at each location. That is, the sum of potential energy plus kinetic energy equals 100 joules. So halfway down the plane, where the block is half its initial height, the potential energy must be 50 joules. And what does that tell you about the kinetic energy at this point? Can you see it must be 50 joules? And when the block is one quarter of the way down, its potential energy is 75 joules. And that means how much kinetic energy at this location? I hope you said 25 joules. Why? Because 75 joules plus 25 joules equals the total energy of 100 joules. If you were tutoring your friends on this, would they get it? If so, can they see that three quarters the way down its potential energy is 25 joules? which means the kinetic energy at this location must be 75 joules, true? Energy is conserved. Not kinetic energy and not potential energy, but the total energy of the system is conserved. 100 joules at every point. Yum! Consider the potential energies and kinetic energies of a big metal bead that slides due to gravity along an upright wire as shown. Suppose at point A, the bead is at rest with a potential energy of 50 joules. That's 50 joules with respect to lowest point B below. That means that at point B, its potential energy is zero. And suppose its potential energy at C is 25 joules. And let's suppose at point D, potential energy is 10 joules. Do you have enough information to write the correct kinetic energies at all these points? I hope so. We can begin at point A, where we know kinetic energy is zero because the bead is at rest there. Aha, we know what the total energy is going to be at each point, namely 50 joules. With this information, we can fill in all the values of kinetic energy. At point B, kinetic energy has got to be 50 joules, where potential energy is zero. Right? I hope you agree. And at point C, can you see where potential energy is 25 joules? 
kinetic energy there is also 25 joules. And at point D, where potential energy is 10 joules, kinetic energy must be 40 joules. So we see that along the wire, the sum of the potential energies and kinetic energies is the same. Yum. Here's an interesting demonstration. Tracks A and B are made from identical pieces of channel iron, the kind you use to make a bookcase on the wall. They are bent differently, but have the same track lengths. A ball placed at their left ends has potential energy with respect to the level of the right ends of the tracks. When released, this potential energy transforms to kinetic energy. Let me leave you with three questions. When released, how will their kinetic energies compare as they reach the right ends of the tracks? How will their speeds compare at the end points? Now here's the interesting question. Which ball travels along the track in the shortest time? Don't confuse speed with time. Until next time, good potential and kinetic energy. Yum. Now here's an intriguing problem with a simple solution if the conservation of energy is invoked. Acrobat Bari stands atop an elevated platform. He steps off the platform and lands on the end of a seesaw that propels his friend Ari into the air, as routinely happens in a circus. Now here's the problem to be solved. Bari, Mass Big M, drops upon the right end of the seesaw and ideally propels Ari, mass little m, upward into the air. Compared with Barry's initial height h, what maximum height y will Ari reach? Before we attempt a solution, what's going on here? First, the problem states that Ari is ideally propelled upward. The term ideal means we can neglect inefficiencies such as air resistance, friction, or heat generated as the seesaw rotates and hits the ground. Is this going to be a complex energy transfer problem? One where we'll have to find the velocity of Barry at the bottom of his jump from his acquired kinetic energy? And then do similarly for Ari as he acquires kinetic energy to propel himself upward? Is this one of those messy problems? Not if we apply the conservation of energy. All we need to do is to look at the initial and end points. Since the system is ideal, initial and final energies are the same. So let's equate Ari's acquired potential energy at the top of his trajectory, where his kinetic energy reaches zero, to Bari's initial potential energy. In equation form, that means... Potential energy of Ari equals potential energy of Bari, or mgy Ari equals big M G H Bari, where y is the maximum height to which Ari is propelled. H is the height Bari drops. The small m is Ari's mass, and the capital M is Bari's mass. Then we see, in canceling G's, hey, you know what? The problem is solved. The solution tells us that the relative heights of Ari and Barry depend upon their relative masses. If the masses of Ari and Barry are the same, then Ari will rise just as far as Barry drops. Or, if Ari has half the mass of Barry, Ari will be propelled to twice the initial height of Barry. Hats off to the conservation of energy. Or, as we like to say, yum. Now, I want to leave you with a question. Suppose Barry drops a vertical distance of four meters to the seesaw. If Ari is replaced with a circus dog, Bo, who has one-fifth the mass of Barry, and the Bo's trainer, Mo, is positioned 20 meters high for a hoped-for catch, 
Will Bo's propulsion be enough to reach Mo? Until next time, good energy. The simplest machine is the lever. Centuries ago, the Greek philosopher Archimedes said that given a long enough lever and a place to stand, he could lift the world. Let's investigate this claim. A lever consists of a length of wood or a metal bar supported by a fulcrum, which is the red triangular support in the figure. A lever can multiply force or simply change the direction of an applied force. In this case, an applied force on the left end lifts a load, our dog bow, on the other end. Operation of a lever follows the conservation of energy. At the same time we do work on one end, say by pushing down on it, the other end does the same amount of work in lifting our load, in this case, dog bow. In accord with the conservation of energy and assuming no friction, Work input will equal work output, or force times distance input will equal force times distance output. In this case, where the input side of the lever is longer than the shorter output side, we write this with a big D for input and a big F for output. We write different size symbols to indicate relative magnitudes. In this way, a lever is able to multiply input forces. An example of a lever in disguise is a simple pulley. Nellie uses a pulley to lift a load. She pulls downward and the load moves upward. This simple pulley only changes the direction of her force. Can you see the lever within the pulley that Nellie Newton uses to lift a load? Let's look at this with symbols. Force times distance input equals force times distance output. We show the weight of the load with symbol W and the force she applied, F. Then F times D equals W times H. So the force F she exerts multiplied by the distance D pulled equals W times H, the resulting work done on the load W. The force F that Nellie exerts is equal to the tension in the rope. But what is that tension? It's the same at Nellie's end as at the end supporting the weight W. So I erase Nellie's force F and replace it with weight W. Hence, D equals H or H equals D. Either way. As said, this pulley arrangement gives no advantage other than changing the direction of Nellie's force. Consider a different arrangement with the load supported by two strands of the same rope. The strand attached to the ceiling and the strand that Nellie pulls upward. Note on the lever nature of the pulley that the fulcrum is at the left rather than in the center as before. Output at the middle and input at the right. So the tension in the rope, which is the same everywhere along the rope, is only half W. And we see that the height to which the load is raised is F times D equals W times H. W over 2 times D equals W times H is equal to half Nellie's pulling distance D. A little geometry confirms this. Since the left side of the rope doesn't move up and the right side moves up a distance d, the load moves an average of these two rope motions, which is one half d. So often in physics, there's more than one way to get the same answer. 
We'll see in a bit that counting rope strands supporting a load is usually the easiest way to analyze a pulley system. Here's a double pulley system. This time Nelly pulls downward. How many strands support the load? Again, it's just two, not three. The strand Nelly is holding doesn't directly support the load. So again, the tension is W over two. From F times D equals W times H. W over two times D equals WH. So we see H equals half D. Again, the height raised is half the distance that Nelly pulls. If, for example, she pulls downward 50 centimeters, the load rises 25 centimeters. Ah, this time Nelly has a three pulley system and again lifts the load by pulling downward. How many strands support the load? Counting them, we see it's three. Three strands supporting the load means the tension in the rope is W over three. We pretend that the ropes are all vertical, although for clarity our compressed view shows a slant, particularly in the middle rope. And from force times D equals W times H, W over three times D equals W times H, where we see H equals one third D. So for every 30 centimeters of downward pull, Nelly raises the load one third, 10 centimeters. For lifting heavy loads like the engine of an automobile, even more complicated pulley arrangements may be necessary like a chain hoist, which we won't explore here. The factor of force multiplication is called the mechanical advantage, which is the ratio of the output force to the input force. Levers and pulleys multiply forces or distances, but please remember, never energy. No machine can multiply energy. So, could Archimedes use a long, long lever to lift the world? In principle, yes. Archimedes was talking about an ideal case, but a case with merit. He was excited because he had discovered the principle of force multiplication. Pulleys were considered are ideal without friction. In practice, friction significantly reduces the mechanical advantage. Many of the systems we study in physics are ideal systems. Though ideal systems seldom occur in practice, treating systems as if they were ideal is very helpful. Clouds are removed that may otherwise obscure the yum physics beneath. If you get into engineering or advanced physics, then you can deal with more practical situations. For now, let me leave you with a question. If 10 strands of rope support a load in a complex but ideal pulley system, how much force must Nelly supply to lift a thousand Newton load? Again, 10 strands, how much force to lift 1,000 Newtons? Until next time, good energy. This is an actual sketch made by Isaac Newton. It shows the paths of a cannonball fired at different speeds from the top of a hypothetical mountain. Newton asserted that if fired fast enough, so the curved path of the cannonball matched the curvature of Earth, it would fall indefinitely. Here's a similar sketch. Let's call this Newton's Mountain, which we'll imagine is high enough to be above the effects of air drag. Let's put a cannon at the top of the mountain. If there were no gravity, then a horizontally fired cannonball would follow a straight line path. But there is gravity, so a fired cannonball would fall beneath this straight line path. Let's fire one. <coughs> a little higher speed. <coughs> higher speed. <coughs>
Let's fire at really high speed. <laughs> My goodness, look at this. The cannonball would... <laughs> Got to get the cannon out of the way. But the path matches Earth's curvature, and the cannonball falls all around the Earth without it ever touching the ground. It's an Earth satellite. Newton made calculations of what this speed would be and realized that cannonballs could never be fired that fast. Rocketry wasn't the order of the day back then, and certainly he wasn't hip to multi-stage rockets. So Newton did not envision humans ever putting satellites in orbit. What was the enormous speed that Newton calculated? I think you can calculate that speed also in your head without a calculator if you let me guide your thinking a bit. There are two things you need to know. Number one, that an object falling beneath a straight line path falls a vertical distance of five meters in its first second of fall. That's the distance an apple would fall in one second if you dropped it from the roof of your house. The second thing you need to know is how round Earth is. A geometrical fact about the curvature of Earth is that its surface drops a vertical distance of 5 meters for every 8,000 meters tangent to its surface. 8,000 meters is 8 kilometers. Consider a portion of Earth in a desert region where the land is flat and without obstructions. Let's mount a laser on a tripod about a meter above ground level and shine a laser beam horizontally out across the desert floor. Due to Earth's curvature, the beam downrange would be higher above the ground than at its starting point. At 8 kilometers downrange, the beam would be 5 meters above its starting level. This may prove interesting. Now suppose we replace the laser with a super cannon, one that can fire cannonballs with incredibly high speeds. Furthermore, we pretend there is no air resistance. What we want to do is calculate what Newton calculated, but in a different way. To begin, suppose we fire the cannonball at a speed of 2 kilometers per second. Then at the end of one second, with no Earth gravity, the cannonball will have reached 2,000 meters downrange. That's 2 kilometers. But there is gravity, and it falls below this point. How far? That's right, 5 meters but it would hit the ground before this happened. If the cannonball were to be airborne during this time, would have to dig a trench in the sand. Clearly, two kilometers per second is not fast enough for orbit. Let's fire the cannonball at twice the speed, at four kilometers per second. This time, the cannonball travels four kilometers during this second. But again, it would hit the ground before one second elapses, unless we dig another trench. I hope you can see where this is going. Let's try six kilometers per second. Is this fast enough so that we don't have to dig another trench? No, again, we'd have to dig sand out of the way, but notice, not as deep. Is there a speed wherein we don't have to dig a trench at all? And what is this speed? Can you see that if it gets 8 kilometers downrange in one second and falls 5 meters below where it would go with no gravity, that no trench would be necessary? What's the speed? I hope you said 8 kilometers per second. At 8 kilometers per second, it never touches the ground. Note something interesting. Since there's no air drag to slow it down, when the cannonball gets to the 8 kilometer distance, it's moving just as fast as initially so it would repeat falling beneath a new tangent every second. Unless some force interrupts it, it would fall indefinitely. It would be an Earth satellite. Yum. Now, 8 kilometers per second doesn't sound fast, but convert it to miles per hour and you get 18,000 miles per hour. At higher elevations, orbital speed is less. For example, the International Space Station orbits at an average speed of 7.7 .7 kilometers per second, a bit less than 8 kilometers per second. Is the space station above Earth's gravity? No. What it is above is Earth's atmosphere, 
most of it anyway. Because of slight air drag, every once in a while, the space station has to be given a boost in speed. Astronauts inside are in a continual state of free fall, which feels like there's no gravity. But Earth gravity at that altitude is nearly 90% of what it is here at Earth's surface. Without it, the space station and all Earth satellites would fly off into straight line paths. Let me leave you with a question. Why does a satellite in circular orbit maintain a constant speed? And tie this to your answer as to why a bowling ball rolling along an alley also has a constant speed. Both a satellite and the bowling ball are pulled downward by gravity. So why don't they speed up? Until next time, good energy. Consider our planet Earth in space and these sample positions of an Earth satellite in circular orbit. Before the idea of inertia was understood, people thought that a force in the direction of motion was responsible for motion. They imagined angels pushing on the planets. Newton changed all that and taught us that the only force acting on a satellite acts toward the body it orbits. That's the gravitational force. And what if this force disappeared? Then the satellite would fly off in a straight line path. No force, no orbital path. Note that each of the force vectors are the same size and point to Earth's center. Same size because the satellite circles at the same distance from Earth. Note also that they're perpendicular to the orbital path. The 90 degree angle means there's no component of force along the orbital path, which further means no change in speed. From an energy standpoint, that means no change in kinetic energy. And since distance remains constant, no change in potential energy. So both kinetic energy and potential energy are constant all along the orbital path. So a satellite in circular orbit effectively coasts at an unchanging speed all the way around and around and around. Now things are different for a satellite in an elliptical orbit. Consider these sample positions for such a satellite. Since the distances from Earth are different, the forces are different. Weak are far from Earth and stronger when closer, in accord with the inverse square law. So the speeds are different also. Kepler was the first to discover the elliptical paths of planets about the Sun early in the 17th century. He discovered that planets travel fastest closest to the Sun and slowest farther away. But he had no explanation as to why. Just as a projectile tossed upward slows as it rises and speeds up as it returns, so it is with any satellite. Kepler never viewed a satellite as a projectile. That planets are projectiles falling around the Sun, just as our Moon is a projectile falling around Earth. This way of thinking escaped Kepler. Let's talk energy conservation. The sum of the potential energy and kinetic energy at any point along the satellite path is the same as at any other point. Hence, where the kinetic energy is greatest, potential energy is least, and vice versa. We can look at the changes in speed by considering the components of gravitational force along the satellite path. The component perpendicular to the satellite path, shown as a white vector here, doesn't affect speed, but changes the direction of motion, curving it away from a straight line path. More interesting is the component along the path, which we make purple here. That component of force changes speed. When in the same direction of, of motion, speed's increased. But here on the other side, the purple component slows the satellite. That's because the satellite is going against gravity there. So for our satellite, we see it has the least speed farthest from Earth and the most when closest. It falls around and around indefinitely. I want to leave you with a question. What becomes of the purple component of force along the satellite's path when the satellite is closest to and farthest from Earth? 
and more important, why? Until next time, good energy.